You're not free with your Cadillac. You're doing just exactly what the man wants you to do. Buy his goods so you'll never have any real economic freedom. He wants you to buy everything he, he advertises on TV so he'll keep you perpetually owing your soul to the company store. You're not free. You're a slave. The j -Bo Show is back. I'm your host, j -Bo. I want to send a very special thank you to my sister, Sierra Gladney, for usage of equipment needed to produce this episode of The j -Bo Show. The intro for this episode of The j -Bo Show is Ron, You're Not Free, Rhyme to This in Your Car, Part 3 by Casper. You can find You're Not Free, Rhyme to This in Your Car, Part 3 by Casper on his album titled Black Salami. And last but not least... My guest on this episode of the J-Bo Show is one of the best musicians from Dallas, Texas. A man who's been down with me and with the J-Bo Show for a long time. Give it up for my man, Casper. All right, thank you Casper, man. Me. Thank you for taking the time to yeah, be a guest on my real. show, thank man. Thank you I like, appreciate so much you, for man. having me. You're welcome, I really appreciate man. that. You're welcome. On that song, You're Not Free, it opens up with a message about materialism yeah. and about the slave mentality. Uh... I notice on Twitter, too, you're critical of people who have a lot of money or people who feel like because they have money, they should be entitled to being treated a certain way. Uh, is that a thing in your music, man? Um, It's like a, I feel like it's more of a mental thing that I kind of think about a lot. Like, mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first found that sample, I threw it in there because I love vocal samples and I found it and I was like, I can kind of relate to this. Like, you're not free with your Cadillac. You're not free because like... I think it was, um, it kind of like ties into me in a way with like a reference from Baby Boy or something where they're talking about how many millionaires are you wearing? And it just like, he says that um, mm -hmm. at some point in the movie and I'm just kind of thinking about how like, almost in a way it kind of trips me out how like we are accustomed to buying these brands and buying into like these major like million, like million dollar companies and stuff like that. Right. And I just think it's like kind of interesting because you look at from my perspective, like, you kind of see the people coming up out of Dallas-Fort Worth and, like, there's a lot of good stuff, but most of the time I feel like is kind of, they, like, talk about materialistic things, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, 
I'm kind of like I try to stay a little more down to earth and stuff you know like I don't know yeah. <laughs> just like um, I feel like there's more to talk about with music than what you have so you mm-hmm. feel like it's other musicians in the area, other uh, beat makers or producers or rappers, they talk a lot about uh, being materialistic in their music. I wouldn't say necessarily beat makers. A lot of the beat makers that I know are very out there, like down to earth, super chill dudes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, like, I don't, it's hard to speak for a bunch of artists, especially in the Dallas Fort Worth like area. Yeah. But some of the stuff that I see just in general, not from just this area, just in general, I see a bunch of kind of materialistic kind of things about like, how many chains you have and that's that's been like a theme for a while i guess but it just kind of gets old to me after a while you know i got you yeah where did that sample come from man with the guy speaking on the beginning um, of the song? i don't remember the dude's name i know i was online and i just searched vintage um like vintage gospel like um yeah. vintage sermons and stuff yeah, it because, sounded like a sermon like a preacher yeah talking. um I, I have a good like i have a good number of preacher records that i find at josie records okay cool and They'll usually talk about some like really wise stuff, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I can relate to this. I'm gonna put this in a beat yeah. or something. So it's like it's cool to share something that you've heard and something that I can relate to, and then put it out there publicly, and other people can hear it. Mm-hmm. Like that's my favorite thing about music is like if I think something and mm-hmm. somebody is like talking about it. Like if I have a Reggie Jackson sample and they're talking about how we are all people, I'll probably put that in a beat because that's something I can relate to. Cool. On Bandcamp, you describe yourself as a beat maker. What's a beat maker, in your opinion? Okay, to me, ooh, I know it's kind. Of, that's kind of a tricky question. I know a bunch of people have different definitions. Um, for me, being a beat maker, I kind of feel like I love to take a bunch of little snippets from songs. Like, I'm definitely guilty of like taking a loop and just looping it sometimes. But I love chopping up a sample or like really pitching down. A percussion sample and somebody's like wow what is the sound i have no clue where that came from i look at myself as a beat maker kind of as like um making an aural um collage make collages I yeah make, like collages. like collages that you can like um i don't know like a collage that you can listen to so that mm-hmm. you listen to this music and you hear all these different sounds mm-hmm. and that has like the vinyl crackle and stuff in the background and like i love Playing with effects, I love to make things that you can listen to, mm-hmm. and you can break it down, mm-hmm. and be like, oh, there's so many different things going on at the same time. I can like, hear that. Um, when I first listened to, I think it was an old, a older Mac Miller album, I remember I was listening to one of the songs mm-hmm. on his album, Watching Movies with the Sound Off. There's like almost any song on there. Mm-hmm. You can listen to it like five times and hear something new in the background every time, like, bird sounds or something like that mm-hmm. and I was like that is so cool to me right so, so when you make beats like you really pay attention to the detail I try to pay attention to the detail and I love to put little things in there like mm-hmm. if you're listening really hard or you're really focused on the music I like to hide things in there yeah. that you might not hear the first time or you might hear at low volumes or something mm-hmm. so it's always fun because I, I love to mix it up or like pan things over to one side okay I noticed too man like your music is really chill it's really laid back really mellow uh, is that done on purpose? Um, I feel like that's kind of my niche in a way. Okay. Um, I remember I first started wanting to make beats when I heard um, Black Sunday by Cypress Hill. And DJ Muggs just had... It kind of started about, like, I really love everybody's beats. Who was making stuff on the SP-1200? Like, it was... They would combine samples, and it had this gritty the, texture to it. The SP-1200 is a, uh, it's a sampler. It's yeah. a beat machine that's mm-hmm. been used by a lot of hip-hop producers. Yeah, Madlib uh, yeah. used to use one, and Lord Finesse. Lord uh-huh. Finesse is, like, my one of my idols that I look at. Mm-hmm. I would listen to their beats, mm-hmm. and i just hear all these things, and I was like, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. And they mostly did, like, kind of chill-hop, like, laid-back hip-hop stuff, like... Um, mm-hmm. Pete Rock type beats, like his more chill stuff. That's mm-hmm. stuff that I kind of listened to and I was like, this is a cool sample. And it kind of inspired me to, I want to make stuff like that for myself, you know? Right. So I, I, I think that's like an intentional thing. I really enjoy making chill kind of beats. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's just something that, um, that's kind of my niche in a way. So I definitely like to branch out, but that's one thing I can always go back to. Like, I love Fender Road samples. Like, George Duke, Herbie Hancock, like, I live for those, like, samples like that. Mm-hmm. That's my favorite, like, type of samples, and it's so, like, so chill to listen to. 
Cool. Like you can just hear a riff or a Bob James sample, and you're like, "That's already chill." And mm-hmm. then you can throw some drums on it and bass lines and stuff, and it's like popping. <laughs> Got you. In hip hop, man, there's a lot of conversation between uh, the difference between a, a beat maker and a producer. Do you hear a lot of that, or do you think there's a difference between what a beat maker does and what a quote unquote uh, record producer or a music producer does? Um, I think there's a lot of different definitions. Um, for me, like when I did Black Salami. I was kind of, I feel like I was taking on more of the producer role because I would sit down with my friends and we'd kind of write out a script and I'd be like, can you act like a pastor or something? Or can you act like this? Mm -hmm. Or let's do ad libs of us like hollering in the background. Like with Black Salami, I feel like I did the beats and Mm -hmm. I just did the music. But from a producing standpoint, I kind of wrote everything out and I composed everything and I sent like, I sent things to people and I was like, could you rap about this? Or kind of like. Most of the songs kind of had a theme behind it, Mm. and I sent it to the artist, and I was like, what do you think about this? Right. And most of the time, like, like, everybody went along with it, and they thought it was, like, a cool idea and put their own little twist on it. So from... So you you make beats and you produce. Yeah. Because that's what it sounds like. That's kind of what I wanted to do. Like, um, I don't rap. I I don't think I could ever hop in a mic like that Mm -hmm. and take myself seriously. But I wanted to put out something that I could rightfully call my project, you know? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because um, you, you, don't, you don't rap and you don't sing, but you know how to tell somebody who raps and who does sing, okay, go in and say this like this or do this like that. Yeah, I feel like it's, I kind of approached it almost in a way, I kind of want to say like an Eric Lau um, okay. album. because he's, ben, an, he's an electronic producer. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Ben Hickson put me on... Eric Lau and I started listening mm. to it and I thought it was cool how it was kind of like his album yeah. but he had people like other really talented like vocalists singing over his beats right. and I was like that's cool I'd love to do something like that where I make the beat and then we collab on like a theme or something like with Colors of the Universe mm-hmm. that I did with uh, Drew the Villain mm-hmm. uh, we were just kind of like because the Trayvon Martin thing had just happened okay, and so we were just like kind of reminiscing and thinking about police brutality in general mm-hmm. and we we're like this is a really chill beat mm-hmm. that i have what if we sang about that or what if we talked about that and spoke on like started a dialogue about that okay. and that's kind of like i feel like from that aspect because we kind of did that i kind of played the producer role mm-hmm. but i definitely could not have done it without the really talented artists that i had by my side gotcha. you know that Trayvon Martin tragedy happened in 2012, and uh, okay. I noticed on your band camp you said you've been making beats since 2012. So, mm-hmm. was there something going on going on about that time where you, something clicked for you and you said, "Okay, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna have sounds that I want to get out of me, that I want to produce, I want to put down." Like, was there something that happened that influenced you? Um, I just, I really, um, my junior year of high school, like I started getting back into playing drums a lot. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to start making beats because, I, like, as a drummer, I'd always wanted to be in a band. Mm-hmm. But I was like, it's so, like, for me at least, just being in high school, it was so hard to, like, kind of keep a band together because everybody had, like, different things going on. And so I kind of had this mindset that I was like, if I just did everything myself, like beats and stuff, I would be in control of my own output. I would be, con- like, in control of, like, uh, the consistency of the work that I yeah, put yeah, out quality. or lack of the yeah quality the quality control. like it all kind of rested on me right so that was my favorite thing about it but um my junior year I just like I kind of I feel like thought process has kind of changed in a way like my junior year I was kind of like I feel like I'm ready to start on this okay and it was like I was just about to graduate high school and like a mm-hmm. bunch of other stuff had been going on and just things in my life had inspired me to start mm-hmm. doing that like I had like when I make beats, I want people to feel a certain way. That's why mm-hmm. I like to make chill stuff. Mm-hmm. I love somebody to hear something and be like, this makes me feel a type of way. Mm-hmm. So they can relate to kind of how I was feeling when I made that beat. Right. And I feel like my junior year, I was just feeling a bunch of different things. And I, like my creative outlet at that time was making beats and I was getting really serious about it. Gotcha. So I feel like that's kind of how it all came about. Cool. And you said other stuff was going on. Do you, uh, you care to uh, elaborate on what was going on? Um, what, what, what other things are going on that uh, influenced you? Um, there was just a bunch of like, I don't know, there was a bunch of stuff going on, like things were getting kind of hectic with high school mm-hmm. and just stuff like that. And I mean, like looking back, it was like, it wasn't super like deep or anything like that, mm-hmm. but it was just kind of something that I was going through and music was really something that I looked forward to doing. Like I'd come home 
at the end of the day, and I'm like, I just want to work on music, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't know. It's like it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of tricky in a way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the name of that album, man. The one that's on Bandcamp, uh, Black <laughs> Salami. What's up with the title? Okay, so Black Salami. Um, it started off as a joke, uh huh. Because <laughs> um, the very like the very first sample is from like an old school porno video. That one of my homeboys had showed me, and uh -huh. that's what like <laughs> originally like I love to make skits and stuff using samples, mm -hmm. and so the first thing that kind of started was I made like kind of a skit mm -hmm. with this like this <laughs> this really cheesy dialogue from this like porno video or whatever, and I was uh -huh. like, this is cool, and then like I was joking around with one of my friends one day, and I was like, wouldn't it be funny if somebody had a mixtape called Black Salami? Uh -huh. And it was just like, I didn't really think too much about it. Like, looking back, it's it's still funny to me. Yeah. But when I like when I first did it, I was like, I'm going to name it Black Salami. Yeah. And that was it. Like, I just, I just slapped it on there, and I was like, done for the day. Okay. So I didn't really put too much thought into it, but it's always something that I can look back on and, like, laugh about it. Cool, cool. <laughs> Now, on the front cover, man, there's a picture of uh, about three boys. Yeah. Uh, it's like they're playing. Yeah. Uh, on the front cover, like in somebody's front yard. Yeah. Who are those kids on the front um, cover, man? Okay, so I'm I'm definitely on the front, and I loved... I was going through... Um, when I started, like, working on Black Salami, mm -hmm. I was thinking, what am I going to do for an album cover? And right. I feel like your music really says... I feel like an album cover really represents your music. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of the first impression that I get. Like if I look at an album and I don't know what it's about, mm -hmm. I'll usually try to guess what kind of music it is, especially with crate digging. I'll try to guess what kind of music or what sounds might be on there mm -hmm. just based by looking at the, um, just based on like looking at the album jacket or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to find an album cover and I was going through old photos that my mom had taken because like, Back in 99, when all those were taken, we, like, I was three, um, mm -hmm. we just had, like, disposable, like, those Kodak film cameras or whatever that you could pick up at uh, Eckerd's yeah. before they had CVS. Mm -hmm. But, um, so, like, everything was just taken on, like, film, and I was going through old pictures one day, and I was just kind of, like, looking back on stuff, mm -hmm. and I found that picture, and it had this crazy hue to it, like, the only thing that I changed on the Black Salami album cover is I just added text. Like, I didn't add any special colors. That's exactly oh, how wow. the original photo came out. Yeah. And I saw how it was kind of like this green, warm vibe. Yeah, yeah, Compared to everything else, it didn't just look like a normal picture. And I was like, yeah. whoa, why does this look that way? Like, it was super cool to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought about, like, the sunshine. Like, just kind of how everything looked. Like, it was taken in the summer. And mm -hmm. I just thought about, just like, back then as a kid, like, how fun it was. You know, like, mm -hmm. when you look at a picture and you just feel a certain type of way. Yeah. I felt like that really reminded me of the chill music that I try to make, and I was like, I feel like these would like go hand in hand with each other. Okay. And it was just, it was just, I don't know, something that happened really quick, kind of in a way. Mm -hmm. Like just the name and stuff, I didn't think much about it. The picture, I thought it was perfect, and I didn't think much about it. I was like, I'm just gonna go with this. I thought like it felt natural, it felt good. Yeah. To like choose that, you know, yeah. like that was like that will always be something I'm proud of. Like just that album cover, I think looks cool. Cool. You know? Who are those other boys? Um, the other boys on there are two of my childhood friends. Um, we used to call them Maddie and John John. I'm Facebook friends with like one of them. Uh huh. Cause I mean we haven't really talked since back then. It was just like a play date kind of thing. Cause my mom, my mom's been a nanny forever, uh -huh. and she knew those boys through like other nannies and stuff. Okay. And we always used to get together when we were little, and we go to the zoo and go to like the aquarium and like play at each other's houses and stuff and get like pizza and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. We all just like kind of grew up together in a way, and then I haven't really seen them since. But I don't mm -hmm. even know if they know about that mm -hmm. or whatever. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It's just a cool picture. I don't know if so. They you have you haven't told the one that you keep up with on social media. That, hey man, like your picture on the front cover. I don't, I don't know if anybody's seen it. <laughs> really? Uh, uh, I didn't really think about it, like about it too much. Okay. But um, I'm not sure. I'm gonna hit him up. And be like, hey, you're on the, <laughs> you're on the cover of this. Like I said, like it was just something that I thought was cool. Yeah. I didn't really think about it yeah. too much in a way. <laughs> I got you. Uh, do you sell your music? Um, I've to kind of taken a step back from it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm definitely trying to right now, because like okay. that's just 
just kind of the hustle in a way like i really at first when i did black salami i kind of wanted my beats to be the center point of the mm-hmm. art and since then like i put so much work into that it kind of drained me for a while uh-huh. like i remember right after it came out like a lot of stuff had like a lot of struggles i kind of gone through because i had laptops breaking down or people like fell through and stuff mm-hmm. and i was i kind of took it upon myself to drive out to a bunch of different places and get this stuff recorded like mm-hmm. i would haul all my gear yeah and be like okay we're gonna record this stuff um i just got kind of drained out on it for a while like i never stopped making music Mm -hmm. but as far as like packing stuff up and bringing it to someone's house so we could record a track Mm -hmm. i just kind of tried to stay away from that for a while because i don't know like it just kind of drained me in a way so now i try to focus like i'm definitely working on selling beats again Mm -hmm. i'm super picky about how something sounds Mm -hmm. like that's that's why I haven't put out anything in all, like almost an entire year mm-hmm. because I'm so picky now. Yeah. Just about how something, because I want something to like, uh, perfectly match like how I hear it in my head. Yeah. You know, like I'm just super picky mm-hmm. about that, and I'm a huge fan of quality over quantity. Because mm-hmm. I know a bunch of people who are consistently putting out good stuff on SoundCloud, mm-hmm. but I also know a few cats who like they'll put out anything on SoundCloud, and I don't want that. I, don't, I would hate for somebody to be, like, looking at my SoundCloud and they're mm-hmm. like, oh, this dude just puts out anything, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So I'm just picky about it. it. It sounds good, man. You know, and I appreciate you letting me, you know, use some of your yeah. music, man. For real, show, I really man. I appreciate that. that. So you said you're picky about your music and, you're, you know, you're all about quality control and being in control of, you know, what it sounds like. Yeah. So why don't you let me use your music? Like, I, I ran into you. You came into Josie. Yeah. And we were just chopping it up, chopping it up. And I was like, uh... And you told me that you made music. I was like, okay, I want to hear it. Let me listen to it. So you went straight out to the car. Yeah. Got me a copy of the CD. I remember that. I took it home. Like a week later, I was listening to it. And I was like, man, this is dope. And then I think I just hit you up on like SoundCloud or Bandcamp or something like that. And I asked you for your permission to use it. And you're just like, yeah, sure, man. Go ahead. Go for it. So like, why did you give me, like, you didn't know me that well. Like, why did you give me permission um, to use it? I don't know. Like, I love when people can like get together and agree if something's dope or if like i don't know like most of the people back then that i was closer with i showed them black salami and i didn't say this was mine i was like hey i want to show you this song and just see what people would think and a bunch of like most of the time people would be like oh that's really cool yeah. i'd be like yeah i made that yeah <laughs> like it was like i i hate so so so, so what did they say man it's garbage man it sucks that actually okay that actually didn't happen to me and i totally mm. anticipated it like why i don't know man like i try not to think too much about music and like as long as i'm comfortable with it if somebody doesn't like something like there's a bunch of people i know that only listen to trap stuff they're like man i don't like that old school hip-hop thing Mm -hmm. and that's just like everybody has their own taste like i totally anticipated for people to be like this album sucks really because at first when i did black salami like it was for fun yeah. Like, it was a lot of it for fun. Like, yeah. we did a lot of joking around on that album. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's called Black Salami. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't take myself too seriously. Right, yeah. Um, it wasn't, like, a little dicky type thing. Like, I was just, like, doing it for fun. Yeah. Because I'd never, like, I'd never put out anything before. And it's crazy to me how anybody who has, like, a mic and a laptop can technically make beats. Anybody right. can technically produce something. So it was, right. like, cool to me. I was like, man, what if I make a mixtape for fun and just put it out and see what happens? Yeah. And then, like, I actually got some, like, really good positive feedback from it. So that kind of inspired me to keep working. Okay. So. Cool, cool. All right. (laughs) So your name is Casper. And it's kind of like a play on the the cartoon character. Casper Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's spelled (laughs) differently, but Casper the Friendly Ghost. And your handle on Twitter is Young Clorox. Oh, I. <laughs> so, so what's the? Okay, so, so, so no, correct me if I'm wrong. So I think I'm seeing some kind of connection. You're a very pale guy. You're a pale a, guy. Okay, so I'm a real pale dude. Yeah, and you're like, a really pale dude. So I've Casper, cha- those <laughs> clear Clorox. Um, white, white. I've changed. I've changed my Twitter handle since then. Like I'm trying to get everything to match up now. Uh-huh. But I used to have a few friends back in high school who would call me Casper, uh-huh. just as like a joke, yeah. and I was like. I'm cool with that because, like, I'm a super pale dude. And, yeah. like, everywhere I used to go, like, people would always ask me. They'd be like, man, are you albino or something? Like, people would still ask me that. They'll be like, man, are you albino? Because you're, like, super pale. And I'm like, I mean, I'm just I'm just a pale dude. Like, <laughs> even if I go to Florida or whatever, like, I'm yeah. still a pale dude yeah. at the end of the day. Like, And, I mean, like, I kind of, like, own up to it because, like, 
I used to be like on the low. I used to be kind of self conscious about it. I was like, really? man, I wish I wasn't so pale. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, now I'm like, I'm cool with it. But it's but, cool. It's you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I feel and, like and you use it to your advantage. You know, you can make yeah. it creative. You know what I mean? And so, so it's like, you're cool. taking ownership of it. That's what yeah. I try to do. And like, I had a few people in high school who used to call me Casper. And then that was like my junior year too. And I was like, okay, mm-hmm. what if I started producing as Casper? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like it, it all kind of happened at, mm-hmm. exactly at the same time, mm-hmm. so I didn't really think too much about it then, and I yeah. think that was a good thing. Like you kind, you kind of like you just have to go with like with what people call you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, when people give you names, pseudonyms, or, or nicknames or whatever, like it's re- usually based on like how you behave or how yeah, you for look real. or something yeah. like that. You know what I mean? So like, so I wanted to like truthful, own you know? up to it. Yeah. And I mean, I kind of feel like I'm more like because Casper is also like. <laughs> First of all, he's, like, super pale or whatever, yeah. so, like, there was that joke, but from the other standpoint, like, Casper is a ghost, and I'm yeah. so guilty about that now, like, I've been ghosted, for real, yeah. like, I will be off map, you know, like, I'll pop up every now and then, like, I'll be at Josie, or I'll pop up at, like, some of the clubs downtown in Deep Ellum, mm-hmm. like, I'll just pop up, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so, it's kind of, like, I feel like I'm kind of living up to an image in a way, like, I'm super pale to begin with, but yeah. I've also been off map like a ghost for almost a year just working on music because i want like i want stuff to be good and i'm all about learning the craft Mm -hmm. because i don't i don't i like i remember when post malone came out everybody Mm -hmm. was calling him a culture vulture yeah post malone is a rapper from the dallas area he's from grapevine Mm -hmm. um i remember when he first came out people were Mm -hmm. like man this dude's not real about it yeah you know what's the name of his his hit song uh white Uh, iverson white iverson yeah yeah um i just remember when that came out like people get hate Especially when they're first coming up, mm-hmm. but um, I just want to seem as like true to the art form as possible. Like I love learning about the background of where samples came from mm-hmm. and like what made people do this like artistic mm-hmm. technique with their mm-hmm. sample. Like I'm all about trying to learn everything I can, mm-hmm. sound design and just beat making in general. Like mm-hmm. I want to learn everything there is to learn, mm-hmm. and not for the sake of like being the greatest or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I just, it's just something that I'm passionate about mm-hmm. and I want to explore it. It, like explore it for everything that it is mm-hmm. so that's just kind of that's kind of what i've been up to since like black salami dropped i was like man i put this out in such a short time mm-hmm. i wonder what more i could do if i went off for a while mm-hmm. learned mm-hmm. more and then came back seriously you know right, right so that's pretty much what i've been doing okay and you have a lot of hip-hop influences and hip-hop was created by young black people and young hispanic people mm-hmm in the inner city, man, and you mentioned uh, Post Malone, who's white, yeah. you know, and about people calling him a, a culture vulture. You know, you've heard that a lot in hip hop with uh, with white artists. You know, with uh, Mac Lamore and Ryan Lewis winning that Grammy of the Year over Kendrick yeah. Lamar a couple years Absolutely. ago. With Eminem, I've heard it a million times. With Eminem, you know, his whole career, even today, I, I still don't understand it, but. Even today, people call him a culture vulture mm-hmm. and things like that. Vanilla Ice, Dallas owned Vanilla Ice, you know. Yeah, yeah he, absolutely. He's, got it. he's still getting it too, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's like years there's later, definitely so. exceptions, but um, do you like? Do you feel like a lot of? Is there a lot of pressure on you here in Dallas because you're a white kid doing hip hop music? Is that do you do you get a lot of? Uh, I, a lot of. Uh, I remember when I first started doing it, it was kind of intimidating, mm-hmm. and I mean like. I definitely want to learn more because just because I'm passionate about it, yeah. but I also didn't want to be making beats and you know somebody like um, it's like oh it's just a white dude making beats you know mm-hmm. like I don't feel like there's much pressure I feel like just based on being in Dallas I feel mm-hmm. like there's just a slight kind of thing about pressure just in general like with Alchemist. Alchemist has made beats for everybody, yeah. and that's a that's mm-hmm. a, a white producer, that mm-hmm. beat maker producer. Yeah, like he does it all because he used to rap on his own stuff. Right, that's just somebody that I really look up to, and mm-hmm. he learned how to chop samples and stuff from DJ Mugs of Cypress Hill. Mm-hmm. And I kind of look up to Alchemist in a way where I feel like it doesn't matter what your race is, like mm-hmm. as long as you are passionate and yeah. s- like true to an art form, and mm-hmm. people can see that about you. It doesn't matter what race you are because yeah. my thing about music is, to me, music is just like about communication. It is, man. It's an art, and art shouldn't yeah. have a color to it. Yeah, you absolutely. I mean? And that's kind of that was also kind of the background to colors of the universe. Like, mm-hmm. people can like relate on subjects despite their race, despite from coming like despite coming from different backgrounds. People can still get together and make hip hop music, you know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I've had people ask me before, like. You're a white dude. Why do you enjoy making hip hop beats? Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's just kind of a weird thing to me because like, 
I feel like there's such a huge art form behind it. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously. Yeah. There's a huge art form behind it, but as far as, like, the sample thing goes, which is, like, what I try to do with my beats. Yeah. And making collages and stuff, there's so many different things that you can learn just from listening to old records and stuff. Like, I didn't know anything about jazz mm -hmm. before I started, and now, like, um, there's so much more I have to learn about jazz. But I found out, obviously, who, like, I found out who Isaac Hayes was, and I found mm -hmm. out about, like, all these different soul artists, and then I mm -hmm. learned about jazz artists and mm -hmm. stuff. And then, like, now I'm looking more at, like, world music and mm -hmm. stuff, and I know so many, like, I've learned so much, you know, like, I've kind of taught myself a lot just through the art of hip hop yeah. and that's so cool to me like mm. I, I tell people if they ask me you know I'm just like I don't know I learned so much through hip hop mm -hmm. I know so much because of hip hop it's yeah. not just like this brainless mentality that I feel like some people can put on hip hop you know mm -hmm. I got you man like, it's a real art form what did you grow up listening to what, what was playing in your house or in your parents cars uh, what, what were you listening to growing up as a kid man um, I was definitely not <laughs> I was not brought up around hip hop at all like mm -hmm. my parents are two totally different spectrums of like musical taste like my dad he really like when I was growing up my dad always used to listen to um just like classic rock like Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, The Who, mm -hmm. like just super classic rock stuff. Yeah. And my mom she'll just listen to like the straight up radio but she always used to listen to Counting Crows. Okay. That's, like, one of her favorite bands. <laughs> and I always liked Counting Crows because it had, like, that pop kind of, like, musicality to it. And the songs were catchy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I read in, like, an interview with Adam Duritz that he loves hip-hop. Uh -huh. And I thought that was so cool. Like, he's a huge De La Soul fan. Oh, yeah? And he gets inspiration from them to keep really consistent timing with their songs. Uh -huh. And I was like, that's kind of why I like, you know, that's kind of yeah. why I like hip-hop so much. And I started, like, in fourth grade, I first, like got put onto my first Beatles CDs mm -hmm. and then I loved all the psychedelic stuff mm -hmm. and I started getting into like more Led Zeppelin and I loved all the crazy like Jimi Hendrix stuff like the super crazy out there weird psychedelic stuff right mm -hmm. and then I remember I think the first the th like I kind of feel like the first hip-hop thing I kind of got into was I was listening to Licensed to Ill by the Beastie Boys, okay. and I heard a bunch of Led Zeppelin samples in there, and I was like, yeah. what? Yeah. And I like played it back, and I was like, mm -hmm. they sampled a Led Zeppelin thing. Yeah. And I was like, that's super cool how they did that, and mm -hmm. made it their own thing. And I was right. like, that's something I could see myself doing in a way. Okay, cool, man. I got to ask you about this profile picture on Bandcamp, man. It's a, it's an animation of you shirtless. Oh, I remember that. Wearing, yeah. wearing sunglasses. You're you're in a pool of like purple liquid with <laughs> yeah. ice cubes. Yeah. In the background there's a forest with a pyramid and purple fruit I remember that. in the middle. What's yeah. up with that, man? Okay. Explain it. Um the original photo just came from a photo shoot that I did with my friend Johnny. Like we'd gotten out from college classes. Someday mm -hmm. like it was, like, sometime during, like, the college semester, and so we were like, hey, do you want to go do a picture session? Mm -hmm. And so we went to this place that my homies and I used to always go during my senior year of high school. It was called the Davis Building, and there's, like, a <laughs> there's like a pool and a hot tub and stuff up there, and we always, like, we used to always chill up there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to take them to this place because they'd never seen it before, and that was, like, a super cool place to me at the time. Yeah. And my friend Johnny had taken that picture and there's this artist that I know named Jesse Lanham, mm -hmm. and um, he did he does a bunch of those like kind of Microsoft Paint looking pictures. Like mm -hmm. he does that from scratch. And I found him on Instagram because he did a bunch for Tyler the Creator, and he did some for Earl Sweatshirt and okay. Mac Miller. And okay. they all saw that he did the art, and some of them posted about it. Like if you scroll back through their Instagrams or whatever, you'll find some of his pictures that they post, and they're like, "Check out this kid. Yeah. He does dope art." And I paid ten bucks for that picture. Like really? I PayPal the dude ten bucks. Wow. And um, I still talk to him every now and then. Mm -hmm. Like he's he's definitely still out there. Like um, I was eighteen, I think, at the time when I gave him that, and he was like fifteen or sixteen. I was like, "That's cool that this young dude is out there doing yeah. this." But um, I kind of described. I was like, "I just love." I just, like, I came up with not the craziest thing I could think of, but I was like, what are these kind of weird out there visualizations that I love people to think about mm -hmm. with my music? And I was yeah. like, what if you drew this and this and this? And he went with it, and yeah. he took it to this whole other level, yeah. like, by himself. Yeah. And it was, like, a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. 
and we both like we both really liked the picture yeah after it was done and i loved it yeah. and um i don't really use that picture that much anymore because it's like it's an older picture yeah. but i still leave it up on my band camp because it's like it's always like a super cool picture to me yeah you know it's something cool. i'm always like kind of proud of and that's a, that's a good dude like jesse lynn he's cool, a good cool. like good guy got you got you on your Twitter profile, man, there's a banner on the background for a, a website called Low Music. Yeah, Group. LO Collective. Yeah, um, what's that? Okay, so it's kind of defunct now. Um, LO Collective, it got turned into something else like just a few weeks ago. I don't know what the new name is, but LO mm-hmm. Collective was a group of guys that I found on SoundCloud. And there's a, there's a bunch of really good, talented people. There's a guy called Landon Sears. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like a rapper and a singer. And there's a guy called Chris Miller who's mm-hmm. a rapper and singer. Like we're all super close, mm-hmm. and they're. Um, it was kind of weird how it happened because I have like my exclusive Gmail account for Casper Beats or whatever, uh-huh. and the manager of that collective, at the time his name is Joseph Chandler. Mm-hmm. He just emailed me and he was like, "We really like your production. Would you like to kind of be put on as our producer?" and make stuff for these artists and i listened Mm -hmm. to all their stuff and they were doing a bunch of chill 90s stuff like Mm -hmm. kind of the chill mellow beats that i'm was trying to do and i was like wow i didn't know these dudes were out here like that like singing soulfully on like old soul samples and stuff and that was i was like this feels right like these are a good group of like super talented guys and so they kind of put me on their website and stuff Mm -hmm. um i don't think it's up there anymore Mm -hmm. but um I don't know. Like I need, I need to go back and change it. But that was a, that was like my first collective, where I, I didn't know any of those guys. I met them all online. Really? I still never have met any of those dudes in person because they're all wow. out in Nashville. Okay. Um, but they were rapping and singing out in Nashville, and they hit me up. And yeah. They're like, "Your music's really good. Would you like to do beats and stuff for us?" And I was like, "Of course." Yeah. So like, we're working on stuff right now, mm-hmm. and. It's been a while because mm-hmm. everybody gets so busy. Like we're all doing college stuff and mm-hmm. just job stuff at the same time. Like music is almost like music is definitely uh, it's like a priority mm-hmm. in my eyes. But it's like <laughs> it's hard to get a bunch of stuff done. You know. I hear you. I so hear you. Um, we're all working on stuff right now. There's a bunch of talented guys, and it was like always super cool because I didn't know them. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's cool, man. What's your ambition, man? What's my ambition? Yeah, what's your ambition? I feel like my ambition, um, I would really just like to be, not recognized, I would love one day for somebody to just listen to my beats and be like, wow, that's a cool dude. Like, I watch Rhythm Roulette, like Mass Appeal, the mm, YouTube yeah. channel. Yeah, they do the this, producers making beats. Yeah, they do this the series yeah. called um, Rhythm Roulette. Right. And I watch that every single week. Like, mm-hmm. I would love to get on that show one day. Who's I, your favorite one? Mm. Um, I feel like either LPs from Run the Jewels. Okay. Yeah, LPs, yeah. Kirk Knight's Never episode. Kirk Knight, he's from Pro Era. He does a bunch of stuff with um, Joey Badass. Okay. Okay. Um, he's from Pro Era. He his episode's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Eric the Architect recently did one. Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of really good people on there, but I think. My favorite Rhythm Roulette one is either the Large Professor episode okay. or they just got Ninth Wonder on there not that long yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, Ninth's good. Ninth, yeah, yeah. That's my favorite one. Absolutely Ninth winning. Wonder, Black yeah. Milk. Black Milk was on there, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've met him here a couple really? times, man, in Dallas. Yeah, that he was, lives um, here, yeah, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, in his Rhythm Roulette episode, he went and dug at Bill's Records. And oh, I was yeah? like, that's cool. Like, okay. he's standing next to this old, like, <laughs> he's digging through a shelf that I've dug through before. Yeah. So it's just kind of cool to me. Like, mm-hmm. that's something that I would love to do. Like, I love communicating with people through music yeah. exclusively, you know, in a way. Um, I love communicating with people through music. I love putting out music that people can enjoy, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I would just love to be – I don't even do it for, like, the recognition. I would just love for somebody someday to, like, listen to my stuff, just stumble across my stuff, even if it's just on SoundCloud, and listen and be like, hey, this is pretty cool. Yeah, That's what it's all about for me is just the communication and – just like people vibing over music, you know? Good deal. Good deal, mm-hmm. man. All right, we're going to play a couple games, man. All right. Our first game is going to be called To Get to Know You Better. Whew. Then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to play another <laughs> game called True or False. Okay. All right, so with uh, To Get to Know You Better, I'm going to throw out a statement, and you just say the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. All right? You ready? Cool. Yeah. All right. First question. Super Mario 
or Sonic the Hedgehog? Oh, Super Mario Brothers. Why? Okay, <laughs> back when I was in first grade, um, my dad used to have a Super NES, mm-hmm. and I remember when I first found it, I lived for Super Mario <laughs> Brothers. He used to take me to GameStop yeah. like every single weekend. Like really? before I before I did the records thing, uh-huh. I was crazy into Nintendo games, yeah. and we used to go to GameStop back when they still had Super NES cartridges, yeah. and we used to buy like. Um, all those old school games, like I had Star Wars, I had Indiana Jones, Super Mario Brothers all the way. Like, um, my very first game I ever played was um, Super Mario World. Really? Super NES, yeah. Cool, man, cool. Super Mario, heads down. <laughs> <laughs> the NBA Slam Dunk Contest or Major League Baseball's Home Run Derby? Uh, Major League Baseball Home Run Derby. Really? Yeah. Over the Slam Dunk Contest? Absolutely. I got I've, to the Dunk Contest. Okay, so man. I might be considered whack for this. Mm-hmm. I like basketball. Mm-hmm. I've never been the biggest basketball fan. I just, I used to play baseball a little, mm-hmm. and I used, I was also really huge into baseball cards. Yeah. Baseball just clicks with me. Really? Yeah, like Texas Rangers and stuff. I don't follow them as closely as I used to, but baseball is always going to be my favorite sport. Really? I, lo- I love baseball. Who's yeah. going to win the World Series? Ooh, that's a tough one. If the Indians win tonight, it's over. For real? Yeah, they went up 3-1 last night. Who, who are they playing right now? I'm seeing, you don't know, who the, you don't know who's bad. playing in the World I'm, Series? I'm bad about this. I follow the Rangers, but it's I... The, it's <laughs> the, the Cleveland Indians and the Chicago Cubs. The first time the Cubs have been yeah, in the World Series since 1945. Was it like 76 years or something? 71 years. 71? Yeah, 71 years. I saw years. that. I was yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cubs or Indians? Yeah. I feel like Indians got it. That's just Indians. me. Yeah. I feel like Indians. Yeah, they might wrap it up tonight. They can. We'll see. Uh, we'll I think see. I think Indians might have it. You think so? I Ooh. think so. What's always on your grocery list? Tea. Lipton tea. Really? Yeah. That's like what I was drinking right now, man. Sweet tea. I love that, tea. Man. Okay, yeah. Lipton yeah. tea. I love the lemon, the half yeah. lemonade, half just sweet tea brew. Oh, yeah. That's what I live for. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Lipton tea is always on my grocery list. Or like vitamin water. Cool, cool. Yeah. Who's going to win the presidential election? I'm going to say Hillary. Yeah, I think so too, man. I think she's going to win. I don't know. It's not just a perspective thing from the analysts or whatever that I've been following. Mm-hmm. Everybody's saying landslide Hillary. Mm-hmm. Time will tell. Yeah, we'll see what. Yeah. A week and a half? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I already voted. I got out there really? a second day. Good deal. I man. did my Good part, deal. so <laughs> we'll cool. see, man. Good deal. All right, our second game, true or false, man. I throw out a true or false statement, Okay. and you tell me what you think about it, all right? Okay. All right, first one. True or false? Good things come to those who wait. Uh, I'm going to say true. Really? Yeah. Um, I think it's not just about waiting. I feel like as long as you're consistently putting in a lot of work towards a, reaching a goal or something, mm-hmm. things will work out in some way or another, like some form or another. I feel like that's true. I'm going to say true. Got you. True or false? If you can't beat them, join them. False. I don't know. I'm going to say false. I feel like... You say keep fighting, huh? If you got something that you were that's yeah, worth fighting they, for. I don't know. I feel like the most important thing that I've learned is, like, just be you. Just do you. Yeah. I don't mean, like, don't follow the wave. Do whatever you're vibing with. I feel like I kind of relate to that in a way. Like, everybody's micing, like, Bryson Tiller beats. Nah, I'm going to stick with my, <laughs> my yeah. 90s old school sound and stuff, you know? I'm going to do me. I got you. True or false? What you can't remember... Didn't happen. Ooh, um, I'm gonna say true. Really? I guess I'll, I guess I'll say true. So um, if you went somewhere like you got like blackout, like just messed up, and you can't remember what happened, it doesn't count. Um, I wouldn't say it doesn't count. I wouldn't focus <laughs> on it too much. That's just me. I mean, <laughs> if it happened, I guess it happened. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing you could do, but I wouldn't look too much into it. They said, man, Casper, last night, man, said you went to Deep Ellum, man. You blacked out. For real? You, you went home with a booger wolf, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I don't recall all that. I just call it a day. That's just me. <laughs> I'm not tripping. <laughs> I got you. All right, I got one more, man. All right. True or false? Now, this one, no joke. I, I, was, I was grocery shopping in Memphis a few months ago, man. Okay. And I saw this spray painted on the back of this old dude's uh, hoodie. As I was standing in line to check out, it was funny to me, man. It said, quote, real niggas don't die. They live in the sky. True or false? I think that's true. Think it's true? Yeah, I'd say true. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, like, I can I can say true. Hmm. Okay. I feel like uh, just not as far as, like, a spirituality type thing. If somebody leaves, like, a legacy or something, like, mm-hmm. somebody is truly remembered for something, that thing will live on for a while, you know what I'm saying? It never dies. Yeah, it doesn't die off. Cool. That message keeps resonating that they left. Cool. My name is Casper, and I'm a... Beat maker. <laughs> there you go, folks. On the J-Bo Show, my boy Casper, the beat maker, the soul music producer, the sampler. <laughs> my God, the best musician, one of the best musicians from Dallas, Texas. I really appreciate Casper, that. Casper, thanks again, man. Yeah, thank you for, for having me. being a guest on my show. Man. You got anything else you want to say? Any comments, suggestions, complaints? Um, Just thank you for having me. I really appreciate everybody who's even listening to stuff that I put out. That means a lot to me. So thank y'all. Good y'all deal, are the man. reason I do what I do. Good deal, man. Thank you. And that's another episode of the J-Bo Show and the Raps. And we out.